Well, hi, I'm Susan Rocco. I'm introducing you to our SPIN conference workshop, Autism Supports, See Through My Eyes. This is a re-recording of the wonderful workshop that was given on October 17th at our virtual SPIN conference with two fabulous co-presenters. Uh, Benjamin Chu is unable to be with us at this moment, but we hope to re-record his comments soon. And we do have Alicia Kim, uh, who is a board certified behavioral analyst with over a decade of professional experience working with individuals with autism and other disabilities. She has experience providing applied behavioral analysis, or as we like to call it, ABA services in the home, in the clinic, in the community, and in school settings. She's currently an educational specialist in the Office of Student Support Services at the Hawaii State Department of Education. Alicia is a lover of all things Disney, as many of us are, and she enjoys cooking and traveling during her free time. And we really value her wisdom that she's about to impart. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Susan. So as we all know, we are in the middle of a global pandemic. COVID-19 has turned all of our worlds upside down this year and have impacted us in so many ways. Stores, movie theaters, restaurants, parks, all the fun and recreational things we were used to doing as part of our daily routines are now closed or operating differently. There are also new norms that we must all adjust to, such as wearing masks in public, uh, physical distancing while around other people, no longer being able to see friends and families on the weekends, the list can go on and on. And no doubtedly, all of these changes and adjustments we have had all had to endure have caused us to feel an increase in anxiety, depression, or challenging behaviors. I know for sure, if I were to track uh, the number of verbal protests that I have on a daily basis now, it has definitely increased since the beginning of this year. But that aside, these are all things that we are all faced with. But that also means that individuals with autism are also faced with these trying times, and in many cases may find it more difficult to cope with and navigate through all of these changes. Many of you, your families and support teams, have experienced this firsthand and know the toll that it can take. At times, I'm sure things feel like they may all be doom and gloom. So what can you do to help alleviate some of the stress and anxiety that you may have to face? Well, I think the first thing to do is to take a step back, take a breath and give yourself a break. It's easy to look on the internet and see all the perfectly amazing things that people on Pinterest or Instagram are doing during these COVID times, but I'm sure that they all have their fair share of bad days as well because they're not perfect, nobody is. And that's perfectly all right. I know, it may, I know it may sound really cliche, but all you can do, especially given the current situation we're in, is your best. It's really easy to get wrapped up in what we didn't do or what, we, or what went wrong than rather what we did do and what we did do right. Beating yourself up over something that has already happened isn't going to fix it. Even though everything may not always go as planned, as long as you have done your best with what you have where you are, then in my book, you have succeeded. So given this today, I'm not really going to focus on how to react when things don't go as planned, but rather look at some strategies and interventions that can be used to help proactively um, help individuals with autism and their families cope with some of the effects of COVID-19. Um, but given the limited time today, we'll only be sharing a few topic areas in this presentation. So the first intervention that can be used to help individuals with autism navigate through the many changes and new expectations that they encounter is the use of visual supports. Visual supports are meant to make auditory information visual and help make them more or help make abstract ideas such as emotions or time more concrete. 
They typically supplement verbal instructions or words to increase comprehension of what is being said. So for example, take a preschool picture book. The pictures are included in the book to show the child what the words are saying. Many times, visual supports are used to visually organize or sequence of events to assist in understanding and anticipating the order and details of that event. They're also used to cue a response and to facilitate communication. The use of visual supports is intended to help increase independence by decreasing reliance on another person to verbally or physically cue them to respond in some way. One common example of a visual support that may be helpful for individuals with autism or anyone for that matter is a visual schedule. A visual schedule breaks down a routine or activity into smaller tasks to create a sequential visual representation of what the routine or activity is. Similar to how many of us may use a planner or a calendar to plan out our days so that we know what to expect, a visual schedule is meant to provide structure and predictability. When using a visual schedule with an individual with autism, you want to make sure that you are making the schedule manageable. You probably don't want to present an individual a schedule that has 40 items on it. That would be overwhelming for anybody to look at. Because of this, you may need to break the schedule into multiple schedules depending on how many steps are involved. For example, you may need to break a da daily schedule up into individual morning, afternoon, and night schedules, or even taking it a step further and creating a getting ready for school schedule or a doing homework schedule. The schedule should really be personalized to the individual using it based on their skill level, comprehension level, and their preferences. If a child who can read 10 to 15 sight words is using a visual schedule, you may primarily only use pictures, whereas an individual who can read and fully comprehend full sentences may require a schedule with both words and pictures or no pictures at all. It's also important to intersperse preferred activities with less preferred activities on the schedule, as well as to provide reinforcement when the schedule is followed appropriately in order to motivate the individual to complete the schedule. It's also important to show when a step has been completed on the schedule so that the individual knows that the step is done. For example, the individual can cross off the item or check it as all done. Given the new COVID related routines and tasks that may need to be done through the day, you can include these new tasks or include them at a higher frequency throughout the schedule. So for example, because we must now wash our hands more frequently throughout the day, you may want to include that more frequently throughout the schedule, or you may want to include putting on and taking off a mask before and after an activity that involves going into public. It is also helpful to use a timer or an alarm in conjunction with the visual schedule to help indicate when an activity is done and when it is time for the next activity on the schedule to start. If you find that the individual has a hard time completing a step on the schedule, you may need to break that step down even further. So for example, you may need to break down do homework into the individual steps of what doing homework means, such as read a book, take a break, and then do a math worksheet. Again, the schedule should be personalized and customized to the needs of the individual using it. Here are some examples of what a visual schedule might look like. As you can see, they can vary drastically. You even don't have to have a fancy laminated schedule with Velcro and all of that jazz. If you're out and about and you unexpectedly need to go to Target to pick up a few items, you can bust out a piece of scrap paper and write down or draw out a schedule to help the individual transition to and from the new activity. Another example of a visual support is to use visual reminders throughout the individual's environment. Visual reminders are rules that are visually represented in order for clear understanding of what the expectations are. 
It's important to not have too many rules, however. Typically, you want to stay between around three to five rules, as too many rules may become overwhelming or hard to follow. Keep the rules that you have simple with minimal words and try to frame them in a positive way. So for example, state the rule as walking feet rather than no running. It's always better to tell the individual what to do rather than what not to do. You also want to keep the visual reminders in a, visual, in a visible place within eyesight of the individuals and place it in multiple places to increase generalization and awareness of the reminders. Whenever you verbally state the rule, you may also want to point or gesture to the visual support so that they can make the connection. Like the visual schedule, you will want to personalize the visual reminders to the skill level, comprehension level, and the preferences of the individual that they are intended for. And you wanna be sure to provide reinforcement when the rules are followed appropriately. I also want to note that the visual reminders do not need to include pictures. Written words can also serve as visual reminders. So here are just some examples of what visual reminders and rules might look like. Um, these also include a couple of COVID related reminders as well, such as wearing a mask or social distancing. Another useful intervention that can be used to help individuals with autism cope with the many changes COVID has thrown our way is the use of social stories. Social stories provide information in a concrete and literal manner to increase the understanding of an abstract or difficult concept and are oftentimes used to help someone understand how others might behave or respond in a particular situation, to teach a new skill, to help someone cope with changes to routines and unexpected or distressing events, or to teach socially appropriate behaviors. It is useful to personalize the story to the individual by not only meeting their skill and comprehension level, but by also making them the main character of the story. Social stories are used to answer the who, what, when, where, and whys of different social scenarios or behaviors and are many times made up of four different types of sentences. Descriptive sentences answer the WH questions of the situation. So for example, if you are writing a social story about washing hands, a descriptive sentence might be, I wash my hands to keep them clean from germs, which answers the why. You will also want to use perspective sentences in the social story because these describe feelings or opinions related to the situation, which will help with perspective taking. So for example, when I wash my hands, it keeps me healthy and my mom and dad will be happy. Directive sentences are used to state what you want the individual to do and what should be done. So for example, I need to wash my hands when I see dirt on them. Lastly, you can also use a control sentence that helps the individual remember the strategies in the story. So for example, when I wash my hands, it's like baby shark washing his hands in my favorite song. You will want to be sure to use directive and control sentences sparingly, probably only one or two of each in each social story throughout to avoid making the story seem like a demand or something non-preferred. You can read the story or have the individual read the story throughout the day and before the activity discussed in the story is presented to serve as a reminder. Here's an example of what a social story uh, for wearing masks might look like. Here's also a list of tools and resources that you may find helpful when creating visual supports or social stories. The first um, is BoardMaker, which is a popular tool used to generate picture icons but it can be pretty expensive. So I've also included PictoSelector and LessonPix as more affordable or free options. 
Autism focused intervention resources and modules provide video trainings and resources on various evidence based practices for autism that are designed for parents and caregivers and is also a free resource. Autism Speaks and of course Spin Hawaii also have wonderful resources for parents on their websites that you might also find helpful. Also, here are some apps that are used for visual schedules, social stories, and other fun and useful tools um, that you might find helpful to download onto your phone or iPad um, that can easily be transported um, when you go out into public. Before we end, I wanted to shift gears and also talk about some helpful strategies that can be done to help with the stress and anxiety of the current COVID-19 situation. Continue to provide social opportunities for both you and your families. While the, while the word social may have a different meaning nowadays, it doesn't mean that it can't be done. Have those Zoom or FaceTime calls with friends and families or use online gaming or social media to stay connected to others. Now that things are starting to open up, I know some people are getting creative in how they do their social distance get togethers. Continue to collaborate with your school and community partners and any service providers you may have so that they can support you and your family the best way that they can. You also wanna designate family time to stay connected with one another and to Remember to practice self-care, however that may look for you. A mentor of mine years ago once told me that flight attendants tell you to put your face mask on first or your air mask on uh, before you assist your child or others with putting their face mask on because you're no good to anybody if you're not conscious. So I think the same applies here where it's always important for you to take care of yourself so that you can take care of others as well. And last but certainly not least, practice mindfulness. Practicing mindfulness may include calming strategies such as deep breathing to help regulate emotions, decrease anxiety and depression, increase self-regulation and independence, and also assist with better sleep and focus. Thank you so much for your time today. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them for you. And if you would like to contact me after this presentation, my email um, is listed here on the slide and I'm more than happy to assist. Thank you so much, Alicia. Uh, you are a fabulous resource for families and you are a very generous one. Um, those of you that don't know Alicia, uh, may not know that she's one of the leaders and shakers at the state uh, level that's helping shape services for kids with autism. And it's become, uh, much more supportive of kids. Um, there's a lot more detail to ABA and families are generally happier now that all these reforms have been put in place. And I wanted to uh, mention to you, Alicia, that there were several questions asked at our actual conference that we'd like to repeat here so that our audience can hear the answers to them. Would you mind answering a few questions? Yeah, that would be great. Super. The first one is, at what age do you recommend introducing visual supports or schedules? And how do you know if a child is ready to use visual support? Well, I think it's difficult to put a set age range on when a visual schedule can be introduced, um, but it is important for your child to be able to attend um, to a visual or verbal stimulus and to also have the ability to receptively identify objects and pictures so that when you do present um, the visual schedule or the visual cue, um, they know what that means and they're able to attend to the schedule and um, understand what the pictures on the schedule represent. Um, here's another one. A lot of people use weekly planners. How effective is color coding that planner? Um, well, I mean, again, I think that that's up to that individual on whether or not color coding 
um, will be helpful. But I do think that um, color coding can be helpful to try um, because that can help visually organize and structure the information on the, plan on the planner and make it a little bit more manageable. Um, so when you're color coding, you wanna be sure to make it clear um, to the individual using the planner what each color represents. Um, as well as limit the number of colors and groupings that are used on the planner to color code um, the different information. So that way, again, it's more manageable and easy to digest for that person. And color just has a certain attraction to it that makes us want to pay attention. Yep, exactly. I and you can always use, you know, that, that person's favorite colors as well to make it more preferable. Absolutely. And here's another, um, how would you help a child stay focused or motivated when they're having to perform non-preferred activities? Yeah, well, I definitely think that breaking down the non-preferred tasks into smaller um, and more manageable tasks may help with that motivation and kind of getting them to power through it, um, as well as to allow the individual to ask for breaks when they're needed. So even, um, you know, if it's a really challenging task that is something that, you know, really non-preferred for the, the child um, or for that individual, if you know that it's going to frustrate them or maybe, um, you know, cause some non-preferred or challenging behaviors, um, then, you know, you can make it easy for them to ask for a break. So even rather than having them verbally have to ask for a break, um, you could have a break card where when they need that break, they just hand it to you to indicate, hey, I need to take a break. Um, so that way, you know, you're being a little bit more proactive. So that way um, that individual knows that they have those options. Um, I think it's also really important to remember to reinforce the completion of those non-preferred tasks um, so that in the future, um, that individual is more likely um, to complete them again. Um, so I think that those are really important things to remember um, when kind of helping somebody get through uh, non-preferred tasks. Well, thank you so much for that, Alicia. And I'm, I'm throwing out a new question. I hope it, you don't mind. Sure. We've all gone through so much trauma with COVID. And it's interesting to hear the difference in perspectives between the teacher or the uh, therapist and the parent. Can you think of kind of the most uh, common things you're hearing from either parent or teacher about their frustrations with this change in routine and, and consistency? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, especially given the current situation, and especially when schools may have had to go to distance learning, I think one of the main frustrations that I've heard from both sides um, is just um, how to connect with those individuals virtually um, and maintaining those relationships and providing that support um, through virtual means. Um, now that, you know, students may not necessarily be able to come back on campus um, and receive their education that way, um, things like that, it's still, um, how can the teacher support the student and the family? Um, and also how can the, the parents support, you know, the child's learning um, through this kind of different method um, or service delivery model that many of us, you know, have had to adapt to. So I think that that's, you know, one of the most common things that I've been hearing um, from both, you know, the family's perspective, as well as from the teacher and the school's perspective, is just bridging the gap of that virtual um, classroom and how, you know, we can still be a team and work towards um, supporting um, our students. That sounds absolutely right, Alicia. And I liked your slide when you started about people taking a breath and realizing that we're all doing the best that we can and that we need to maintain our relationship with one another in order to help our kids. So thank you so much for that. And thank you for being uh, so generous to give up your time twice to make sure this presentation gets into the hands of new families who were not able to see you on the 17th. Anytime, happy to, happy to be here. Great.
Happy holidays. Thanks, you too. Bye. Well, that's great.